Hello there, Drew Hannish of Whiskey Lore. It's time for another Tasting Tuesday video. Today I am going to be doing a tasting of one whiskey. I'm not doing a comparison today, just going after one whiskey because it is a fascinating whiskey. It is Broken Barrels Cask of Amontillado. And this is a 12 year light whiskey blended with a five year corn whiskey, which means that both of them were distilled at over 160 proof, and then they would have been married together, and then they took staves of Amontillado sherry and put them in the whiskey to give it its flavor. So unlike other whiskeys that are finished in a barrel, the barrel is actually finished in the whiskey, which I think is a fascinating concept because that means that not only are you tasting the age of the inside of the barrel, but you're tasting the age of the outside of the barrel as well. And these guys have a lot of fun breaking these barrels apart and then they, their Instagram and uh, so on and so forth will show you them breaking these things up. And uh, For me, I, that seems like a great job, you know, you got a frustrating day. Let's go out and break some barrels in in the uh, in the back there, and we'll start making some whiskey and doing some enhancement of the flavors with these staves. So, Amontillado is an interesting sherry because it kind of falls in between. When you're talking about Oloroso, that's that's the darker, heavier sherry. And so Amontillado is a little bit lighter than that. And it comes from a separate region. Uh, don't ask me to say what the region is. Uh, it starts with an M and it's, it, I want to say Amontillado, but I'm, I'm not sure that that's exactly correct. But anyway, it comes from its own region. And so you'll find that like Cognac, Cognac comes from its own region. And so a lot of times these develop the names out of the regions that they come out of. Amontillado is going to give you normally a very, you get some of that, that oaky, uh, nutty kind of a flavor out of it. You might get some of that old warehouse tobacco and you, you're going to get some dark fruits out of it as well. Um, you may also find some, uh, some floral herb kind of components to it. it as well. It just depends on the particular sherry that you get. So, Cask of Amontillado, when I was sitting in Los Angeles at uh, Infused Spirits and talking with Seth uh, Bernheim about this, you know, he was talking about how much he really loved Edgar Allan Poe and that story of the Cask of Amontillado. And if you haven't read the story, it is one of his dark stories that talks about being buried alive. And he has several stories like that. Premature Burial is one of my favorites. A lot of people know the Telltale Heart. And so this falls right in line with that. Two friends. One friend is annoyed by the other friend and decides to plot to kill him and chooses carnival as the time to do it and then takes him down into a cellar gets him drunk on uh, on other whiskeys or on not whiskeys on other wines telling him that he's got this amazing cask of amontillado and he wants to share it with him and his friend keeps saying when are you gonna let me taste that when are you gonna let me taste that meanwhile he's getting drunker and drunker and then suddenly he's chained to the wall and out comes the uh, trowel and the bricks and he starts bricking his friend into the wall. Very interesting story. So I won't give away the ending. You got to read it. It's, it's a fun one. I actually, when I was going to college, I did a paper where I had to write about um, a, a poet or a, a writer and 
You know, I mean, there's a lot of names that were floating around on the list that I could pick from, but I was like, can I do Edgar Allan Poe? Because I really want to learn more about this guy. And he had a really dark kind of existence. He started out, uh, he was born in Massachusetts. His um, mother and father, well, his father abandoned the family when he was one. And then a year later, his mother died of consumption, which is tuberculosis. The Subsequently, he gets moved to um, Virginia, of all places. I don't know how he ended up in Virginia with the Allen family, Francis and John Allen. And so the thing that happened there was they didn't really adopt him, but he did take on their name. So now he's Edgar Allan Poe, and he grew up there. His pseudo-stepfather, John and him, did not get along. And apparently there was a little bit of trouble with gambling where Edgar, when he went off to the University of Virginia, this was Thomas Jefferson's brand new university. Jefferson, if you know anything about him, was very liberal in terms of, you know, hey, anything goes. He had a set of rules. Gambling and drinking were things you weren't supposed to be doing, but they really didn't seem to be enforced. So some gambling debts came up. Edgar was apparently not paying for his courses, and so he ends up shuffling out of the University of Virginia, and the family squabbles continue. Then he goes off to West Point. He ends up getting discharged, uh, court-martialed, actually, from West Point, and he kind of pushed, actually, for that. And then, at that time, he had started his writing. He was doing poems, and then he started writing more prose after that. He really wanted to make it on his own. And up to that point, there had yet to have been an American writer who could sustain himself off of writing. But Edgar was determined to do it. He had to take odd jobs. He was doing a... He did some time as a critic, as well as doing his writing and trying to get his stories out there. So he ended up marrying his 13-year-old cousin, first cousin, Virginia Clem. And then a few years later, it, and it seemed to be a happy marriage from all that I've read. And she was playing piano one day and singing, and she had a blood vessel burst in her throat. And then they realized that she had tuberculosis as well, and she ended up dying not long after that. And this is where Edgar's life starts to spiral, and his stories start getting darker and darker. And it ends up that he's in Baltimore. There are multiple stories as to how he potentially died. Probably the most credible was him wandering uh, the streets in the days and they've said he's, he was drunk or, you know, he was on drugs or, you know, he had syphilis. It, 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 it's a lot like the Robert Johnson story, you know, the, the mystery surrounding it and so many different people probably told different stories of it that it kind of got out of hand. So a lot of mystery around that. That's why I always kind of look at the Baltimore Ravens football team and they, you know, they say Ravens and that's due to Edgar Allan Poe and him being in Baltimore. Well, Baltimore wasn't the greatest place uh, in terms of how his life turned out because he ended up dying in the streets of Baltimore. But anyway, that's, that's how that goes. The thing is, is that when he died... His greatest rival, Rufus Griswold, had actually become the executor of his literary works. And he also wrote his obituary, the one that ended up getting put into papers across the country. And he was bent on destroying Edgar Allan Poe's reputation. 
And so he called, he's the one that called him a drug addict and a madman, lunatic, anything he could ascribe to, um, to Edgar Allan Poe that was negative, he was going to do that. And so a lot of the research that you do on Edgar Allan Poe, you start to realize that he really wasn't necessarily that dark of a person. He had his troubles and he was trying to live a life that really wasn't a, a life that had been attempted in America before him. And so that's kind of, kind of how he ended up in the situation that he did. But anyway, I, I love the story of Edgar Allan Poe and I would love to dig in deeper on that maybe someday do a podcast episode around his life, but then that's going to be a series of episodes like Robert Johnson, because you cannot tell a man's life in one 20 to 30 minute episode. Just too difficult. So when you put your nose to this, and if you're, you're used to American whiskeys, uh, you would you would anticipate probably that you're going to end up with some corn, uh, some of the oak, the vanilla, the caramel kind of standing out to you. That's not the case on this at all. This one, the nutty oak is there. I don't really get the tobacco-y kind of thing that, that I would anticipate out of the, the nose on this. There is, you get some, um, I mean, it's 110 proof, so you do get some of that alcohol hitting your nose, so it's hard to take a really deep inhale on this. Yeah, the nuttiness stands out front. There's a little bit of probably a plum meets cherry, some kind of dark fruit coming through there. It has a nice baking spice, like a cinnamon baking spice to it. It really does nose a lot more like you would expect a scotch whiskey to nose. But that, that wood component is really strong on the nose. It almost overwhelms everything else. Yeah, the fruit pulls through the whole thing. Definitely get the plum. Wow. This is a hot whiskey. But it's not the hot that you would really kind of expect. It, it goes for this hot black pepper. And it just saturates your palate. The whiskey doesn't really burn. It's a little bit, but not much. But that pepperiness is so intense that it kind of takes everything over. But you also get this kind of cherry meets, I don't know, like a berry of some form. And then it's just, it kind of disconnects. It's interesting because that heat is out there, the, the berry is there, and then as it starts to fade away, it's like you have two different things going on in your mouth and they're not really connected. You're left with a little bit of a toast and you're left with, and that pepper's gone completely. I mean, it's a clean finish, but it, it leaves that berry kind of hanging there, but they seem disjointed. Like they're, they're both there, but they aren't connected. It's like, it just, it just needs something in between, I think, to connect the dots between those two, to make like an all-star kind of a finish. It's a nice finish. It's just, it's just like, it is one step away from really blowing me away there on the, on the finish. Once you get past that pepper. You put your nose back to it, and I get a little herbally out of it now. Yeah, there's definitely um, an, an herbal, kind of a 
let's say like a, a, an earthy kind of a, a smell to it. And maybe a little bit of that tobacco is coming through there. It's one of those things you, when you know that's a, a something you should be nosing, you really start going on a hunt for it. Yeah, it's an interesting whiskey. It's uh, on the Walker scale. There, it's a it's a zero. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because I almost anticipate sherry finished whiskeys to have a little bit more of a reddish kind of a tint to it, but it looks just like what Scotch blenders think the perfect color for a whiskey is. So, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. It definitely has a lot going on on the nose. The palate, like I say, when it first hits your mouth, the pepper's not there, but then the pepper really comes in and knocks you out as you're going through into the finish. So, this is a limited release bottling. When I was in Kentucky, I did see it. I saw it at a Total Wine in Louisville. So you can still get it, but they're numbered bottles, as you'll see there on the side, that this one is number 649 out of 6,600. And part of the reason that uh, uh, I ended up with this little treasure was, I think, because it was a scarred one that couldn't really sell. So, um, yeah, no, this is this is very interesting, and I think if you are a fan of um, of sherried scotches, you might actually find this to be a really interesting whiskey. I think part of the reason why the the finish feels a little different is because they used light whiskey in here. And so that really high proof, you'd anticipate almost a thinner, more alcohol forward. I mean, you're basically heading towards vodka range in the ABV on this. But it, it really, uh, you know, I think that that may be what is different to me in tasting this one versus tasting some other whiskeys and it'd be interesting to see this is made with um, the um, the light whiskey comes the 12 year old light whiskey comes from MGP the five year old whiskey I'm pretty sure Seth said that that came from Green River which is where they get most of their other whiskeys and they do some rise from there and I love Green River's rye which quarter horse is the one that i've had there and so they're doing some really nice experimentation with that as well so very interesting to taste this hope you enjoyed a little background on edgar Allan poe as well definitely somebody worth reading about and maybe sip one of these while you are reading it and uh, get in the, the mood and taste what fortunato did not have the ability to taste not giving any more of the story away. <laughs> I've gone too far. Too many spoilers. And until next time, cheers and slanjava.